let us get started for today. So we will not do what we usually do. Usually we just take one chapter in the book and we start from the first page and we go on through the chapter. So today we will do something differently. We will have a topic, namely the topic of approximation theory. And this means that the results we will discuss, they are spread all over the chapters that we have discussed so far. So the title, Approximation Theory, And you will find out very soon that actually we already know a lot about approximation theory. So the key idea in approximation theory is that you have something, some phenomena that is described by something that is complicated. And you want to simplify that. You want to describe the same situation but by means of something that is easier. So put it in a popular way, we want to replace something complicated by something that is simple. And of course we need to do that with great care because we don't want to simplify things. It should be such that this more simple expression we're looking at should give us the same information as, as the original and more complicated signal. So, for example, what this could be the very first example could be something that you did already in the public school. I think it was in the fifth grade or something like that that you learned about the number pi. So what you already did at that time was to replace the number pi by something like 3.1 or maybe 3.14, depending on how exact you were at that time. So this is probably the very first case you solved of approximation theory. Then you moved on, and then in high school, you certainly saw more examples because you got the idea of looking at complicated functions and then you would replace them by a tangent. And we know, of course, sometimes this goes very well, sometimes it does not go very well. So if you have a function that just goes like this, and we look at the tangent in this point, we get a line like this. So we know that close to the point where we have the tangent, the tangent will actually give a good approximation to the function. But then when we move away from the point, the approximation will be worse in general. So then you came to the university, and you saw the same idea, but you wanted to do something better. So you still replaced, it, replaced complex, uh, complicated functions by not just tangents, but by Taylor polynomials. which fit very well with what you did in high school because the first order Taylor polynomial and this is exactly the tangent. So now we're just generalizing things in order to get something better. <coughs> we could move on. We could also think about functions that can be uh, described by a Fourier series. So we could think about replacing a Fourier series. A Fourier series is an infinite series, so it's difficult to handle this. So <coughs> we could think about replacing it by a finite partial sum. <coughs> and we could go even further. And we could think about what we did the last week before the break, because in that lecture we considered orthonormal bases and general Hilbert spaces. So again, orthonormal bases will give us an expansion of all elements in the Hilbert space. So we could replace the expression we got in last week. We got what we call the exact representation. In terms of an orthonormal basis. So the exact representation is the one that says that every element in the space, in this Hilbert space we're looking at, 
can be written as the sum from k equal to 1 to infinity. And then we had some coefficients, which were the inner product between v and the k element in the orthonormal basis. And we had to multiply this with the k element in the orthonormal basis. So this is the exact representation we have in terms of orthonormal basis. But you cannot really work with an infinite series in practice. So the idea of approximation would again say you have to replace this by a finite sum. So we replace this by saying now we don't have exactly v, but we, but we have something that is close to v, namely the sum from k equal to 1 up to a sufficiently large number n. And then we have the same coefficients v, e k, e k. So all of this deals with functions. But there are many other cases where we can think about approximation theory. So you could think about compression, co compression of large data sets into smaller data sets. So data compression. which is something that is getting more and more important in science nowadays. For example, also in bioscience, data compression is, is used heavily nowadays. I would like to give you a few examples of this. So you see there's a, a difference here, because up here we are speaking about functions. Now apparently we are speaking about something else. But the re reason that I want to speak a little bit about this is that in about two weeks from now, we will come to the topic of wavelets. And exactly the cases that I will mention here is something that we can deal with in terms of wavelets. So let me show you a picture that you probably didn't expect to see today. This is a picture of some fingerprints. You see, fingerprints, they are just digital images. So they are uh, described in terms of some data sets. And the interesting thing is that you cannot see the difference between these two. And even algorithms that are searching for features in the fingerprint cannot see the difference between these two fingerprints. But one of them, and I don't know which one of them, takes 13 megabytes to store, and the other one takes one megabyte. That means you can see there's a huge rate of compression involved in going from one of the fingerprints to a certain one. But still, they look exactly the same. And this is something that is done using heavily machinery of mathematics, namely this theory of wavelets. And as soon as we come to the theory of wavelets, you'll see that this is based on everything we did in this course. This is based on Hilbert spaces. It's based on operators. This is based on Fourier transform, which we'll do next week also. So this is closely related to what we are doing in Mathematics 4. So data compression, this could, for example, be uh, compression of fingerprints. And I'll tell you the full story about these fingerprints when we re return to them in about three weeks. The truth is that these fingerprints, they are stored by FBI. So you'll get the story about that later. I don't think that many of you are criminals, so I want to show you another picture that is hopefully a little closer to you, namely what happens when you take your bicycle in the morning and you go to DTU. Many of you, I, I don't claim that you look like this, but I just claim that you are probably listening to some music. And if you are listening to music, then you are probably using an, it could be at least, that you are using an MP3 player. And MP3 players, they again take huge data sets and compress them such that you can actually get a whole piece of music on this very small device. So again, this is exactly the same idea. And again, in order to make an MP3 player work, you have to use some uh, wavelet algorithms. They are actually implemented in the MP3 player. So again, this is something where this core subject of mathematics actually come into the game. So we return to, to the more mathematical description of these topics in about three weeks from now, two or three weeks from now. So you can so see that approximation theory is really a wide topic. And we can even put a seven point here and say that everything you're doing, so all engineering and actually all science will be approximation theory. Because in science and engineering, you never describe something exact. You always have a model of something. And when you make a model of something, there will always be some approximation in, in that model. So you see, it really covers a lot of things. Now, 
also in the mathematics we have covered in this course, there are a lot of problems that are related to the approximation theory. And I didn't emphasize on that at the time where I introduced this mathematics for you, but this is what I'll do today. So actually, the function spaces and vector spaces in general we have been looking at in this course are very complicated. So let's give some examples of this. So let me give you an example of one of the spaces that we have been dealing with. So, you know, we have the sequence spaces. So we take some p between 1 and infinity, and we look at Lp on n. And let's just write down what this is. This is the set of all sequences. xk, k going from 1 to infinity, with the property that whenever we take the sum of xk in absolute value to the power p, then we get something finite. And you know, mathematically, we had absolutely no problem dealing with these spaces. But they are not very realistic in, in uh, real life, in the sense that in real life, you cannot deal with an infinite sequence of numbers. As soon as you take some numbers and you plug them into your computer program, you have to truncate to a finite sequence of numbers. And in that sense, it is a very complicated space in the sense that the elements here, they are actually too complicated for technical tools. So let me write V slash computers can only deal with, and let's just call it finite collections of numbers. So this means that certainly we will need some approximation theory in order to deal with these spaces in practice. So this is just one example. Another one of our favorite spaces would be the LP spaces, the capital LP spaces. So they are defined as, again, the set of f from r into c, and then with the property that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the function to the power p dx is finite. And here you get a, si a similar problem, because we are dealing with functions that are defined on the real line, but the real line has infinite length, and you cannot put something of infinite length into a computer. You always have to truncate somewhere. So again, we can put exactly the same text and say that we slash computers can only handle and then in this case, I'll say finite intervals. So again, in order to deal with this space in practice, we need some approximation theory. So what I'll define now is the appropriate context, the appropriate topic in order to describe approximation theory. And then after that, we return to these two examples. So all what we are describing here takes place in the, in the setting of a norm vector space. So let's just take any norm vector space. Let's call it V. And then we want a definition that somehow put emphasis on the idea of looking at a subspace of elements in V that is somewhat simpler than V, but we should be able to approximate all elements in V by elements in that subspace. And the way to say that is to def define the concept of, of a dense subset. So we say that a subset that we call W of V is, and we say it is dense in V, so this is the new word that we are learning here. It is dense in V if, and the condition is that no matter which element we pick in this large, complicated space, we should be able to approximate it 
arbitrated well by elements in this subset. So this says that no matter which element we take, that means for any v in v, we want to be able to approximate this arbitrarily well. That means within a distance of a given epsilon. That means if for any given v and for any epsilon that is positive, there should exist an element in W. So let's call this element W in W such that the norm of V minus W is smaller than or equal to epsilon. I think this definition is actually clear if you try to formulate it without using of epsilon. So let's do that. Let's make the interpretation of what we have here. So look, let's look at some epsilons that are getting smaller and smaller. So let's look at epsilon of the form 1 divided by k, where k is just an integer. Then what it says is that what the definition says is that given any of these epsilon, that gi means given any of the k, Then there is an element which we could now say w, but depending on k, so w with index k. So there's an element wk in w such that, and then we just repeat what is stated here, but with epsilon replaced by, by the epsilon we have here, that is 1 divided by k. So we have norm of v minus wk is smaller than or equal to 1 divided by k. So you see what happened here is that when you let k go to infinity, then 1 divided by k will go to 0. This actually means that wk will convert to v. So the conclusion that comes out here is that if a subset is dense in our vector space, then no matter which element we pick in our space, then we can find a sequence in the set W that converts towards the given element. So that means what, what we get out here can be formulated by saying that arbitrary elements in V can be approximated arbitrarily well by elements in W. And this is actually the essence of approximation theory, that you are not asking to get exactly the element you are looking at. You don't ask to get exactly the V that we are speaking about, but you want to be able to come as close to it as you want. This is exactly what the concept is doing for us. So let's return to, to these examples and see how it looked like here. So there's a lemma in the book And I will actually not give the proof because this is something that is left for you for the problem session today. And what we're doing here is to introduce a certain set of sequences. And um, I will use the notation W because this is what I did here in the book, actually, because you can see it's in, in another chapter, so it's in another uh, context in the book. So in the book, I actually use the letter 
V, but for us here in this context, I think we should call it W because then you directly can see the connection to the definition. So the set is defined in a similar way to, to the LP spaces that we're dealing with here. So again, we look at some, in principle, infinite sequences, xk, k going from 1 up to infinity. But now we make a different assumption. We do not make an assumption of this series being convergent. We make the assumptions that even though we are dealing with an infinite series, only a finite number of the elements are non-zero. So this means that the sequence might be, it might start with 1, 7, 5, 4, and then at some point, 0, 0, 0, and it just continue with zeros. So there are only a finite number of interests where it is non-zero. Then what the statement says is that this is exactly the kind of space we are looking at because W is a dense subset and not just a subset, but actually a subset, subspace, subspace of L, P, N. And this holds not just for one value of P, but it holds for all the values of P we're looking at. So for all P greater than or equal to 1, smaller than infinity. So then we could ask ourselves, is it doing what we want? And I think the answer is yes. Because here we can see we have a subset of the LP space and we can approximate elements in the LP spaces as well as we want. And these elements, the elements that are in the set W, are something that we can work with in practice. Because here, okay, it is an infinite series, but there are just a finite number of entries that are non-zero. And then after that, it's just zero, zero, zero. So this is something we can work with in practice. This is something we can put into our computer if we want. Before we move on to the next example, let's just see what, what does it mean, what I'm stating here. So I would like just to repeat exactly what the definition says. So what the definition says in this case is that if we look at an arbitrary element in our space, that means now we look at an arbitrary element in the LP space, So we look at any sequence xk, k going from 1 to infinity, some element sitting in LP of n. We look at this element, we take any epsilon, then there is an element in, in this subset that means there is a sequence yk k from 1 to infinity belonging to w. That means there is a finite sequence such that, and then we could just write down exactly what we have here, just as a starting point. So we have such that the norm of xk, k equals 1 to infinity minus yk k from 1 to infinity, where the norm we are dealing with now is the p-norm. This is smaller than or equal to epsilon. But I think we should also write up what does this actually mean in the context of our norm. And putting in the LP-norm, this means exactly that the sum of, and then we need to look at the k element of this sequence, which is xk minus yk to the power p, k equal to 1 to infinity, and then the peak root of this, all of this is smaller than or equal to the given epsilon. So this is what you will prove today at the problem session. Let's see what we can do with the other example. We had the case also of the function spaces, LP, that are too complicated. There's also a, a density result for that space.
And now we are returning to one of the spaces that we also dealt with at the time where we introduced LP spaces, namely the space of continuous function with compact support. So it turns out that C, C, R, so let's just repeat the set of continuous functions with compact support. So that means the functions are doing something and then at a certain point they're just equal to zero. So these functions are dense in LP. Or as a vector space, it is dense in LP of R for P greater than or equal to one, smaller than infinity. And again, we can write down exactly what we did here, what it means. So it means that if you, give, if you look at a function f sitting in LP of R and some epsilon greater than zero, then we can find, we can find an element g sitting in C, C, R such that, and then we could write it down exactly like we did here, but now with the functions instead. I'll not do that. Let's just go to the interpretation in terms of the norm. So the norm difference between f and g is smaller than epsilon. And the norm in the LP space means that we're looking at the integral of f of x minus g of x to the power p dx from minus infinity to infinity. And then we take the p root of this, and this is smaller than or equal to epsilon. I think we should look a little bit at this. Let's do it for, for p equal to 1. And actually, I would like you to tell me, if we start with a function f that is just a function in L1, how can we choose this function g that approximates the function in a good way? So for p equal to 1, we just get the condition, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, f of x minus g of x dx smaller than or equal to epsilon. So no, now what I'll do is I'll erase one of the boards and then I make a picture of a typical function f belonging to L1 and then you should tell me how can we choose the function g to be a continuous function with compact support such that this is smaller than or equal to epsilon. So of course we will not do it in the technical sense I just want you to tell me what should be the idea of how to choose that function. So let's look at a typical function in L1. So actually, if none of you are writing from here, it's probably easier to do it here. Is it okay to erase this? Okay. So first of all, the problem with the functions in L1 is they might not have compact support. So I'll make a picture of a function that does not have compact support. But, but still, it should be in L1, so more or less it's forced to tend to zero when we go to plus minus infinity. So let's make a function that goes like this. And then again, here from plus infinity, Again, it is coming like this and going like this. But you know, functions in L1 are not necessarily conti continuous. So it might be that it goes like this, and then it, there's a jump. So it continues like this, and then like this. So this is a, a typical function in L1. So we want to approximate this function with a function that is continuous and has compact support. So you can see there are two problems with the function. It is not continuous, it does not have compact support. So how can we find a continuous function with compact support that approximates this function in the sense that for a given small epsilon, we want this to be smaller than epsilon. So we can put it into two questions. One question is, what can we do about 
the fact that the function is not equal to zero out here, and what can we do about the missing continuity. So let's start with the question about what can, what can we do out here where the function does not equal zero, it just converts to zero. Alexandra? Could you just cut it off when we are so far out that the difference is so small that it's more than just a difference? Yes. So you want to cut it off. So we want this difference measured in the terms of the interval that in an intuitive sense it's in terms of small in, uh, areas out here that are small. So we, joke, we go so far out that the contribution out here of the, of the area is smaller than, say, epsilon divided by 3. Because if you say epsilon divided by 3 as error here, and we say epsilon divided by 3 as error here, then we still have epsilon divided by 3 to take care of the missing continuity. So if you want to do it that way, we could speak about epsilon divided by 3. So what you say is, we just cut it off. And what does it mean to cut it off, actually? Because the function continues. So if you just cut it off, that would mean to just stop here. So this is more or less the beginning of your idea for the function g. But my complaint here is that you don't get continuity if you just cut it off. So what should we do instead of just cutting it off? John? Uh, we should multiply by a function which uh, goes from uh, 0 to 1 uh, in a smooth way. Uh, just a, a function. So you will multiply with a function that makes a smooth connection from 0 up to 1. That's true. That's one way to do it. Uh, it's the best way to do it, but a, a less complicated way to do it would just be to say, we cut it off here, but we want it to be continuous. So instead of just cutting it off, we just putting a small straight line down to 0, and then equal to 0. And we do the same out here. So maybe let me make the picture a little better. So the function goes like, like this. So out here, we have a function that is exactly the same, and then it is cut off again using a, a straight line. So what can we do about the missing continuity? Now we took care of the continuity out here, but then there might be two points of continu uh, discontinuity. There might be more, but let's just say that we have these two points. Question? If we take the rope as we just did at the edges, can we just add a, add a straight line from that uh, takes care of this continuity? Yes, so we cannot add a straight line exactly at the point, no. but what we can do is we can go a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left and then put in a, left, a, a straight line there. So we go here and then we put in a straight line here and we continue like this. And then again here, we put in a straight line. That would be the way to do it. And when we want better and better approximation in terms of smaller and smaller epsilon, this just means that this procedure has to take place far out here. It has to take place far out here. And we have to make straight lines with increasing slope. That would be the way to get good yields. So this will be a function g that is in cc r and approximates the function well. Now I have shown you how to do it for L1, but you can see you can do exactly the trick here, the same trick here when it's raised to the power p. There's no difference in that. Before moving on with the theory, I want to give you yes? Does it hold for p equal to infinity as well or not? No. It does not hold for, for infinity. Because if you look at L infinity. These are just functions that are bounded. So an example of a function that belongs here would be the one that is just equal to 1 on the entire interval. And then whenever you try to approximate that by a function with compact support, you can make this approximating function. So we say, again, this is the function f, and then the function g. You can make it equal to the same on this interval. But because it has compact support, sooner or later, it has to go down to 0. But because the function f is chosen such that it continues to be 1, then the dis 
system here will be equal to one, and that means the supremum norm will be equal to one, and therefore you don't get the approximation. So it is very important that we do this for p smaller than infinity. So what I'll show you now is a very classical theorem. So it dates back to 1870. So this is the famous Weierstrass approximation theorem. And it is actually easier to formulate than the results that we have here. So this is something that I could have formulated for you even before we started Mathematics 4. So what we do here is we consi consider a continuous function But we do not consider a function on the entire real line. We consider a function just on an interval a, b. So f is just a function from the interval a, b into c. So in terms of the notation that we used already in the first lecture, this just says that f belongs to c, a, b. That would be a different way to say that. Then what this theorem says is, that any continuous function can be approximated arbitrarily well by polynomials. So what it says is, given any epsilon, there is a polynomial and let's just write down the polynomial explicitly. So p of x equals to some factor a n x to the power n plus a n minus 1, x to the power n minus 1, plus, and so on, all the way down to a0, such that if you look at the difference between f of x and p of x, then this is always smaller than or equal to epsilon. So let me make a small draft of what this means. So let's take any continuous function on a interval a, b. Let's say we have the interval a, b here. And let's say we are looking at a function that goes like this. So this is the function f. Then what this says is that there's a polynomial which has a distance at most epsilon to the function f of x, no matter which x we are looking at. So we can illustrate that by making what is called a small epsilon band around the function. So instead of just looking at f, we can also look at f of x plus, uh, this would be f of x minus epsilon, and we can look at f of x plus epsilon. And the graph of these functions will look the same way, it is just shifted. So that means we have here, this is the f of x, minus epsilon, and the f of x plus epsilon is going here. So this is what, what is called an epsilon band around our function f. And what the statement says is that there exists a polynomial. That means there exist choices of these coefficients, a n, a n minus 1, and so on, such that the polynomial will run inside this band. So again, let's make just a picture of something that could be a polynomial. The polynomial would be something that goes like this, inside this band. And the question is, why is this a surprising theorem? Why do we need to speak about that 140 years later? Rune? Approximate uh, non-continuous functions. No, you only approximate continuous functions. So what is stated here is, consider a continuous function belonging to this interval. If it is non-continuous, you cannot do it. You can only do it for continuous functions. Because if there's a jump on, on your function, then if you approximate well here with a polynomial, you will not be able to approximate well here. 
at the same time. So it's really important that it is continuous. So why is, why is this an important statement? There's actually a single word in the theorem that tells you that this is surprising. You can just put your finger on one word in the statement to tell why this is surprising. So what is that word? Christoph? The value of the function uh, are compact. Is that the so, so you say, what is compact? Uh, I say that the function that we want to uh, approximate for uh, the polynomial uh, gives us uh, complex values. That's oh, you say that you, you think that, that it is complicated because it takes complex values. This is actually not a problem because if you have a function that takes complex values, you can split it into a function, a real part and an imaginary part, and then you can approximate each of them and then you can put things together. So this is actually not the, com the surprising part. It's another thing that is surprising. Dario? Because? Yes, this is true. So where is the word that makes this surprising? I mean, maybe on this picture I make here, it is not very surprising because you can almost make a straight line, which is a polynomial. I mean, with this gap I made here, you can always, almost just take a straight line, so it's very easy to make a polynomial for the figure I have here. Lina? It's because we say here, you can do it for any epsilon. That means we can do it for this very large epsilon I'm coming with, but we can also do it with an epsilon which is just very, very small. So I want to show you why this is very surprising. I mean, now you got the idea, but I want to demonstrate that by a real concrete example. So now I have a slightly better picture of a function, the one we have here. Let's think about approximating this function. So what I'm doing here is, um, again, to make a relatively big epsilon band and um, it is easy to believe that inside this band there will be a polynomial. But then when we make this band smaller, you can see that it gets really narrow at the places where the function oscillates a lot. Then you get a real narrow band, but you still claim that inside this band there is a polynomial. And of course you can make this band even smaller. And now I'll give you the extreme case of a narrow band, because this is a signal that comes from real life. This is actually a recording of the word alone, somebody record the word alone, and then he played through the loudspeaker, and then the signal looked like this. This is a continuous function, because this is measuring the currency that runs through the cable to the speaker, so this is continuous. And actually, this picture by itself is also an epsilon band, because you know this little pencil that makes a graph, it has a certain width. Of course, this is very small, but this black curve by itself has a certain width. So if you take this small epsilon value, then what this theorem tells you is that there is a polynomial which graph is running inside the epsilon band. That means it is running inside the black curve. That means there is a polynomial which graph look exactly like this figure. And I'm sure if you were sitting in the train one hour ago and your neighbor told you, look, this is a polynomial, then you would say, you're crazy. But now actually what what Weierstrass tells us is there is a polynomial which graph look exactly like this. And of course, this is not a polynomial of degree 3 or 4 or 5. This is a polynomial of degree maybe, I don't know, 500 millions or something like that. But the important statement is, no matter how small we choose this epsilon, there is a polynomial that approximate. That means there is a polynomial that look exactly like this. We don't speak about the degree, we just say that such a polynomial exists. And that's the reason that even 140 years later, we still speak ab about Weierstrass theorem, because this is really a surprising statement when you look at small epsilon. Yes? Yes, Weierstrass theorem and the Taylor theorem. I mean, Taylor is basically the same thing. That's a very good question. So you ask, what is the difference between Weierstrass and Taylor? Does anybody know the answer? Andreas? Because with Weierstrass, you don't get a recipe for doing it, but the, the, the gift is if you just need the function you want to approximate the contingents using a, using a, a Taylor, you have no guarantee that, uh, that this function will actually be, uh, what is it called, analytic. 
differentiable. Sorry? Differ differentiable. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. So this is a very exact answer, but I'm not sure everybody could hear it, so I'll just repeat it. So the difference between Taylor and Weierstrass is here in Weierstrass, we just assume that the function is continuous. This is a very weak assumption, but the price to pay is that the theorem does not tell you anything about how to choose the polynomial. Weierstrass just tells you that it exists. He does not tell you how to, to choose it. But Taylor will tell you how to choose the polynomial, because this is the classical Taylor polynomial. The problem is, in order to use the Taylor polynomial, you need to assume that the function is differentiable. So you have a stronger assumption than what you have here. So it's a better statement, but you pay a price because you have a stronger assumption also. So just before the break, the last two minutes, let's just relate this theorem to, to what we discussed here in the definition. So what Weierstrass actually tells us this is the conclusion we have here. The absolute value of f of x minus p of x is smaller than or equal to epsilon. But it holds for all x in the interval a, b. This means that the supremum over all these values, over all x, is smaller than epsilon. So supremum over x in a, b, f of x minus p of x is smaller than or equal to epsilon. And what this actually means, we have a much nicer expression for this because this is our infinity norm. So this means that the infinity norm of f minus p is smaller than or equal to epsilon. And now you see, now we are again back in exactly the situation of a dense subspace. Because what this says is, given an arbitrary epsilon, given an arbitrary function in this space, the space of continuous functions of the interval a to b, there is a polynomial such that this norm is smaller than or equal to epsilon. So that means the set of polynomials is dense in this space. And it is very important that this is actually a finite interval. If you try to do this with a real line, then the argument would break down. It would not be true anymore. So it, it must be on a finite interval. So what we'll do now is to take our break. And then after the break, I will define a, a concept that is related to this density concepts. And then we get some more examples. <laughs>